from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So, our next speaker, uh, Mona Simpson, is a wonderful writer who has had a remarkable life. I'll touch on a, just a few highlights. As a young woman, an aspiring writer, Mona was an editor at the Paris Review. Her first novel, Anywhere But Here, appeared in 1986 and was highly successful. I might say that I've always, I've always thought that Anywhere But Here was the perfect novel, perfect title for her first novel, at least insofar as it relates to the, the writer's hometown. In retrospect, I wish I'd called my first novel, Get Me Out of This Dump. <laughs> Mona's later novels, uh, The Lost Father, A Regular Guy, Off Keck Road, and My Hollywood were also greeted with uh, both praise and many literary prizes. She's also had a distinguished career as a professor of literature, most recently at UCLA and Bard College. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Mona Simpson. Thank you. It's so nice of you all to come out here today to to celebrate books. And you know, there's this gorgeous day out here, and, and here's here are all of us together because we love to do something each of us by ourselves alone. It's kind of, it's kind of wonderful. So I thought I would start out um, by reading a letter I received recently from a middle school student. Um, I've had a book out this spring, and so I've been interviewed by, by various people, and some very erudite and, and bright, but I thought actually the best questions I received were from someone named Samantha, who's a student at William Wirt Middle School. Dear Ms. Mona Simpson, she writes, I am a student at William Wirt Middle School. Currently, I'm investigating careers to learn which would be best for me. I'm very interested in the writer-author profession, and I would appreciate if you could answer the following questions by tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks in advance. Were you a good student? How did you get your ideas for books? Are your books true stories? Why do you write them? Do you make a lot of money? What types of tasks do you spend most of your time doing? I love that one. What kind of hours do you keep? What are the most frustrating parts of this career? How did you prepare for your career? Do you have any advice on how people interested in this career should prepare? Who helped you get where you are? Samantha. So I thought I'd answer a few of these questions, and then I'd let you see if you all have questions on your own. I thought I'd start out with the, were you a good student? And I can answer this for myself, and I can also answer this on behalf of the many writers I've known. In general, fiction writers, we were okay students. We were not the best students, almost, almost always. We were the person who couldn't stop reading. Um, question number two, how do you get your ideas? That's kind of a great question um, because I don't think, it's very mysterious how you get ideas. There are writers who sort of suffer looking for ideas and then there are writers who have a lot of ideas. I'm one of the writers who tends to have a lot of ideas. But that doesn't mean I could write thousands of thousands of things. I have a lot of ideas and just a few kind of stay with me and, and chase me until I, until I really have to write it. This, um, I had a book out this spring called Casebook, and it was in many ways um, my first attempt at an, at an adult love story. I've written lots of kinds of books, mostly, mostly novels and, and short stories about, about you know, relationships and families aren't, aren't Really, I guess that's what all novels and, and fiction is mostly about. But um, this was, in a way, my first adult love story. But it was told 
kind of in a slant. I, I, I was inspired, I, I sort of got going on it when I got the idea of writing it, not just from the point of view of the people in love, but from the point of view of a son who was spying on his parents and kind of discovered their trouble and their, their story for them. Um, so that's, that's how I got that one. And, and I thought about sort of why I, why I write about the family. And I, I, love, I love setting things. I love writing. I mean, I think all, all the things we write about have all been, in a way, done before. But it's great to find something that is so different in our time. And you can then test your characters um, for the eternal ideas and moral choices and dilemmas they have in the context of the way we live now. Um, what else did she ask? She asked, "Is the story tr are your stories true? That's such a hard question. Because in a way, absolutely. In a way, absolutely not. It, I mean, you, know, you want to make them true. You want to make something, you want to make them true in a, in a deep way. That, that's the, the highest goal, I think, of every, every novelist. Um, whether you write what happened or tell a story that you've experienced yourself or that you've researched and that you've followed uh, step by step, probably not. I mean, usually, usually life is not so shapely. You know, it doesn't necessarily, life doesn't necessarily give an experience um, that, that is clarifying or revelatory, or it doesn't always do that. There's, there's so much, um, so many layers for, for fiction, I think, that involve compression and, and I don't know, um, concentration. It's, so it's much more intense. I, I teach, and when I first started teaching, a student wrote a story that was about a camper who had um, poisoned the Kool-Aid of her cabin, in her cabin, and the kids had, had drank it, and one of them got terribly sick, or two of them got terribly sick, and, you know, were hospitalized and near death, and, of course, you know, lawyers were involved, her parents were called, it was, it was a legal nightmare, it, it was a financial huge thing for the family. Um, but the way it was written, it, it seemed very cartoon-like, and I, I didn't believe it, and I called her in, and I said, you know, you might want to try writing something a little closer to your life. At which point she said, but this all happened. I did it. This was true. But it didn't come off as true. You know, you, if, you, if you read the story, you would have never believed it. You would have thought that this was a made-up whim. So it's not necessarily true that the truth in life translates to the truth in fiction. Um, but it is what we're after, nonetheless. And it is, I think there is an element of autobiographical truth in every novel, not necessarily in the characters or the events, but I think you, you often pick up, like if you read a lot of Alice Munro or you read a lot of everybody, anyone really, often the same themes recur, the same motifs. And those obviously are, are central themes for the writer and things they think about all the time. I mean, this most recent novel I wrote obviously couldn't have been autobiographical because it was the, the narrator, the I, is, is a young boy. And of course, I haven't, I haven't been a boy. I have a boy. I love a boy. But even, even my own son, in most parts of the novel, he's not. None of it is, is him. I used a little of his language here and there. there. Um, but, and some of the games he played, but that, that was about it. Um, in a funny way, I mean, the boy I created is in a way a mother's fantasy. I mean, who but a mother could dream up a boy who's obsessed with his parents? Um, <laughs> you know, but that's not to say that there are no true feelings or internal life in the book. I feel like my fiction uses life only when 
life is better than what I can make up. And that's not so often. I, I, I think that writers should really draw on everything for their fiction, their lives, the lives of people they know, and the lives they know through reading and from being in the world and the vast realms of, of what they can imagine, too, and which, by which I don't mean only things that are fantastic. I mean, I think there's an enormous amount of imagination in what's, what's usually called realism in fiction. Um, I needed a filter for the love story, and so I, I created a fairly naive one. We all have cultural assumptions about, about love stories, about you know, where blame can be assigned, about something being no, you know, someone's fault or no fault. We now have no-fault divorce, and that's, that's a value in our society. Um, but I wanted a really naive narrator who would, who would sort of say, wah, you know, when, when he was exposed to pain. Um, why do you write your books? That's another of her questions. Well, I guess what I want to find through fiction are the answers to the ancient questions, really, of, of how to live and what is a good life. What choices do people have? How can they, wherever they find themselves on the economic ladder, find beauty and meaning? So that's what, why I do it. Um, do you make a lot of money? No. <laughs> what kind of tasks do you find yourself spending most of your time doing? It's actually kind of a fun question, because actually, I do a lot of tasks that you would, you would not expect for my books. For example, um, I was once a journalist right after college. I worked as a journalist for two years. And, and I loved it, but I hated having to be, get the story in before somebody else did. I, I hated the sort of competitive aspect of getting the scoop and having to always have an angle. I mean, some of the stories I found most interesting had no angle. They were just like, let's go figure out how these immigrants live in these tents, you know, by the side of the San Francisco Bay. Let's let's just see how people live there for for a couple of days. But that, you know, there was no peg. But now as a fiction writer, I spend a lot of time interviewing and I just never write the article because I do it for my characters. So for this most recent book case book, I interviewed Los Angeles private detectives which was which was fascinating because it's 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 a, it's in a way if, if I say Los Angeles private detective you probably have all kinds of ideas about it I did, um, but there I learned a lot of things I mean a lot of detectives now do very different kinds of work you know they're not they're not trying to take pictures of people in hotel rooms having affairs anymore because there's no fault divorce so that wouldn't be so lucrative, but I f I met several detectives one of whom did a lot of security work for celebrities um, and protected them from crazy fans who came to meet them. And then I met another detective who did a lot of background searches for contestants or for, for participants of reality shows. And, and I interviewed a bunch of female mathematicians too, so that's, that's a lot of fun. What kind of hours do you make? Well. That's an interesting question, too. I tend to, um, I now have a middle school, I mean, I have a high schooler. She's starting high school at home. So I still have to drive her to school. So I tend to get up early, go running, drive my daughter to school, come home and write most of the day. But I say that, but not, no one can do that absolutely every day. You know, things come up. Um, but I, I find that for me, there's kind of a watermark. Like, you have to work a certain amount of hours a day. It's not really about how many hours. It's about how deeply immersed you are in the project, how deeply immersed you are in the story. And when you are deeply immersed, things begin to come together. You begin to, the story begins to sort of write itself. And something you put in that you had no idea had a connection to something else in the story suddenly finds its own connection. So you want, you want that level of immersion so that your unconscious is sort of knitting the thing together all the time. And I find for me, three hours is sort of that magic, magic number. If I can work three hours 
then all the rest of the time I'm doing other things, it's still going in my mind. Whereas if I work two and a half hours, sometimes I don't get there. And then all the other hours I'm not working, I'm really not working. So for me, it's, it's to, the challenge is to just push myself over that line every day so I'm deep enough in it that I'm always doing it. Um, what are the most frustrating parts of your career? That's a good question, too. I mean, there are no securities in art. We all know that, I mean, in the deepest sense. I don't mean that there's not enough money, or status, or gold watches, though, of course, there's, there's little enough of all that, too. But what we all want, what we, what we really want, is to write meaningful work that will move people and help people even years from now. I mean, that's, that's why I do this, you know, because certain books changed my life made it possible for me to have a good life, and, and I want to do that too. And of course, there's no way of knowing, really, whether you're on the right track, and it can, it can be lonely. And then there's publication, which is, can be a horror for people who work all alone most days and are essentially shy. I mean, that's, that's why we do something that's, that's something that is not a collaboration. Um, how do you prepare for your career? What advice do you have to someone trying to be a writer? I thought of the advice that one of my professors in graduate school gave us. He said, and this is a guy who edited the New Yorker fiction for years and years, and he said, if you think there's anything else you possibly could do, then go ahead and do that. Question, the last question I'll, I'll cover of Samantha's is, who helped you get where you are? And I'll say that in a minute. Um, but it's almost a metaphysical question, because before you answer that, you almost have to, to know where I am. Um, well, where I am is, is I'm not a number one bestseller. I don't make a, a ton of money. I teach as well as write. Um, but where I am is I'm, I'm actually very content and happy with my life. I'm alive in my work, and I'm proud of it. I do, I've written six books, and that amazes me somehow. And I, I think of myself as doing several things. I teach, and I study, and I write. Um, and, and what can I say? That's a great life. And so many people have helped me. Um, come to, to this place in life, but the one I was thinking of the most was, I've had the same editor for all the, for the time I published my first book on, Anne Close, and she's just, she's a brilliant, wonderful editor, and that's a great thing to have if you're a writer. It's great to have a friend or an editor or somebody who, who follows you through it all along, who can tell you when you're not, your, your game is not at its best, who can tell you the hard truths, but who also knows what you're going for and what your, what your ultimate plan is. She said this beautiful thing. We were on a panel together, and she said with her writers, of course she has a lot of writers, um, it takes a while to learn what their, what their ultimate project is. And to, she likes watching that unfold. And I thought that was a beautiful thing. So. You've heard the middle schoolers' questions, and, and now I'll take yours if you have any. Who has a question? Hey. You said that uh, you write because you were affected by books. What are the, uh, some of the titles that were important in your life and made you want to be a writer? So many, of course, like, um, like everybody. But um, the ones that, it's funny, there's, I, I, was, I was thinking recently that admiration, in a way, is kind of overrated as an as a experience in reading. And I was thinking that the books that, that I love the most are those that really have resonated with me. And that doesn't even necessarily mean they're better than books that haven't resonated with me, but that's why I think it's so great and it's so important 
that we publish a diversity of voices and a diversity of genders and races and geographic you know origins of writers because I think part of part of what we read is when a book really affects you it has the reader brings something to that party too it's not just that it's a great book there are so many great books it's it's a kind of alchemy between you and that book you know so it's it's the right book for you and I think for me those books weirdly enough were one, the one that comes to mind that made me feel I could be a writer, maybe, uh, I, I, I started reading Alice Munro way, way back when. And I always loved her because she writes a lot about the, the Middle West. I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. She was a woman. I, I, I'm a woman. Um, you know, all that. I, I just love, I love her work. But I also felt a strong sort of identity with it. I mean, I, I remember, you know, it's, it's kind of a, I remember as a young person thinking, what a cheap way to read. You know, you don't want to only read things you can identify with. And I don't, and, and we don't. But th that is a part of reading, too. And that, that's kind of a great thing when you're reading something and you feel like, oh, someone else has felt this, too. And then I think, for me, the other great voice in, to me, the, maybe the greatest voice in fiction is, is Tolstoy. I just go back to Tolstoy again and again. I just read those those novels and stories endlessly. There's something sort of beneath that, that voice that comes through even in translation. There's some quality of, of spirit that I just love in, in Tolstoy. Other questions? As, as a teacher, what are some of the books on writing that you recommend to your students? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's funny. I don't really use, for the most part, books on writing in terms of books, books like, um, you know, how to write fiction. But I'm finding increasingly, I, I teach as well, I teach college, but I'm finding increasingly that I, I do go to grammar books because um, I, I don't think, I think students aren't taught, and maybe it's not that they can't write, it's not that they can't think, it's just that I think, I think, at least the students I have, their, their middle school teachers have clearly lost interest in teaching them how to diagram a sentence because they don't know that. So I, I give them grammar books. I give them Strunk and White. I try to give them whimsical books about grammar. There's one that's quite wonderful with vampire in the title. I'm trying to think what it is. Is it the vampire of grammar? I don't know. The yes, the intransitive vampire. Yes, that's, that's a great book. Um, but in terms of, of sort of opening them up to how to write um, fiction, I, I like to give them, you know, I like to give them a paragraph of Proust or a paragraph of Faulkner or uh, several different writers, a paragraph of Virginia Woolf, and just say, um, you know, let's let's count let's count the nouns, count let let's just break it down and see exactly how this is constructed, and let's let's. Let's construct a book like that. Let's use that number of short sentences versus long sentences. You, let's use the same number of adverbs. Let's, let's use that exact, let's, let's break it down and see how they did that. I once taught a class on the novel to five very bright and um, companionable, it was, it was all girls, and they were at NYU at graduate school. It was a year-long class on the novel. And we read Middlemarch and we broke it down chapter by chapter and really analyzed the structure, and that was so useful. And they all wrote books, of course, that had nothing to do with Middlemarch, but they, the collaboration and that kind of specific work together, they remained very close, the girls and the young women as they were, and they, it was very interesting. They stayed friends and they kept sharing work after that year, and each of them eventually published her novel um, and it was kind of a beautiful thing to see because, of course, they didn't all sell their novels at the same time. You know, the, and I was very, very worried that sort of, I was glad that they remained close and that they were able to help each other really in a substantive way. Um, and I hoped that, you know, jealousies or frustrations wouldn't tear them apart. But they actually, they actually managed to surmount it all. And the one who published the last, 
who kept revising and kept revising and kept revising. All the others really helped her in all those iterations, and she sold her book too. And in a funny way, hers was, in a way, the most successful first publication. So it was, it was a nice and interesting story. Thank you. Other questions? I recently um, heard a number of authors speak about, fiction authors speak about how they write. Um, some talking about that they just sit down, they have an idea, they sit down and they go with it. I mean, you talked about serving your three hours, but the question is, how do you start? Others, others have outlines of every chapter and you have a clear vision of where it's going. Is it that you just begin and let it take, the story take you, or do you have a very clear direction to it? I don't do it quite that way. I like to, um, I like to be kind of led, I like to, you know, it's funny, there's, there's inspiration where you, you know, when you're a young writer, you want just to be inspired, and that's what you want. And, you know, the movie version of being a writer is you're hit like a thunderbolt and you sit down and write, write and write and write. And that does happen, of course, but it never happens like that for a whole novel. You know, you might be inspired towards a scene or, or a story, but never, there's a kinds of inspiration. You know, there's a sort of kind of inspiration that comes, like, takes you over, and then there's the kind of inspiration that's a more subtle thing that comes after a couple hours of working. So I, I actually don't, I try and, I want that feeling of kind of something coming really from deeply in my unconscious. So I like to feel that I don't necessarily make a, an, an outline and follow it. I, I sort of go where the heat is, so to speak. Um, and then I, I trust that it will come together. What I usually do is I write pretty intuitively for a first draft. And then I sort of see what I've got. And then I structure it and outline it. But it, it depends on the complexity of the book. Like, I'm, I'm, Alice McDermott, who's a writer I, I greatly admire, is, is here. And unfortunately, she's speaking exactly at this moment. Um, but she has often said, and I've, I've listened to her, that she, she often starts two books at once, and one will take over. And I've, I've never done that before, but this time, right now, since my last book, I've, I have two ideas, and one is fairly discreet, and the other is kind of capacious. And the big one, I have to outline, because otherwise I can tell, I'll just, it'll go off the rails, it'll be too, too, too baggy and, and so, but, so it depends, it kind of depends to me a little bit on the material. I usually have enough of a thread that it'll sort of pull me through. Um, and, and I mean, I write at least three hours a day usually. I write more than that, but um, that's to me sort of the minimum. I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure it did. Hey. Hey. I could not help but notice that the advice from your colleague from the New Yorker was uh, stolen from Rainier Maria Rilke's letter to young poets. Oh, is it? That's funny. I haven't read that for a long time. Um, that was, so maybe, that, well, in fairness to him, he might have been quoting <laughs> Rilke. He might have said Rilke said. It's been a long time. But, but on that saying. note, is there anything that you've noticed in the work of someone else that was just too good not to steal? <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Um, you know, there's a great essay on this. I don't know if you've read it, um, but there's a wonderful essay by um, Jonathan Lethem in, in Harper's some years ago about, about the whole notion of literary theft and how much, how much is actually taken, how much is, is just how much writers, you know, take from literature as opposed to just from their own lives or from their own heads. So. There's many things I've wanted to steal, and I'm sure there are things I have stolen. Sometimes I sort of deliberately um, take on a, a, you know, a, a, a plot or a, a strategy of, of sorts. I, I know um, I'm pals with another writer named Lori Moore, and she she did a beautiful she kind of did a beautiful thing last year. She published a story in the New Yorker. God, I forget what her story was called, but it. It was a direct, deliberate homage of Nabokov's story, Signs and Symbols. And she, she sort of used it 
quite directly, uh, referential is the title of hers, because she wanted, she wanted a title in such a way that people would know. I don't usually do that that directly, but um, that's not to say I wouldn't. I mean, I, I, believe in, I believe in books being in conversation with, with other books. I think that's, that's how we, we grow as a culture. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always against um, the extension of the copyright law you know, to be any longer than it is. I think, I think a, a sort of intellectual commons that we all share is extremely important to our cultural future. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.